I'm Jay from Gallifrey Public Radio, a Doctor Who podcast and part of the Gunny Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other incredible geeky shows at gunnageeknetwork.com. Welcome to episode 174 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we're promoting your podcast. My podcast. In this week's Better Podcasting download, we talk about how the world made a mountain out of a molehill. Like the molehill by my front stoop? Yes. Yes. Because that's annoying. Yes. Finally, in this week's Better Podback, we run down recent feedback from social media and Discord. Lauren, start the show now. Welcome to Better Podcasting, a show where we talk about podcast tips, tools, and best practices to help you succeed with your podcast. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we podcast purely out of the love and fun of it. Podcasting is our hobby, and we recognize that it's yours too. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. Here's your host for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to episode 174 of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen John Drew, and I am pleased to say that Stargate Pioneer is here as usual. I don't know why I say that every time. He's never missed the show. I there's one show one show that i've missed but you've missed two so i've been on more shows than you have sure i don't remember you missing a show but we'll go with it i don't care so that's fine okay Okay. so please call me sp by the way (laughs) and we are glad to be back this week we got a ton to talk about oh my gosh take a look at the show notes i think it's like 35 pages which is a ton but we love to talk about podcasting and normally we start out the show with a how I saved my podcast story. And this time we've got such a big show that we've elected to go by it. However, if you want to get us your how I saved my podcast story, we will talk about it on a future show. This is learning with the class. You say what's happened with your show, how you saved it. And we give that out to everybody else. You can contact us podcast at betterpodcasting.com. Or you can tweet it to us, although that'd be kind of small. What is it up to 270 characters right now or whatever? Something like that. Kind of small for a uh, story on that. Or you can go ahead and send us video or audio. That would be great, too. Oh, this is a fun one that we've got going on today because we here at Better Podcasting often get asked about this question, especially over on the Reddit sphere. I know SP covers this all the time. You know, there's an old adage in podcasting, create good content and they will come. Now, while there might be some underlying truth to this here at Better Podcasting, we've made it no secret that we actually think that that statement is fairly misleading. And to be honest, a little bit lazy because podcasting is rapidly expanding and the reality is that it's becoming harder and harder to find a true niche that doesn't have some level of competition within it already so while creating good content is an area that we do firmly believe that you should definitely put your focus on maybe even your key focus on as the markets become more and more saturated and flooded the odds increase that it's going to be harder for you to stand out in the crowd. Just because you have that good content doesn't mean that people are going to necessarily find you or that you're necessarily going to grab the attention of your potential audience. So what is one way that you counter this to try to grab their attention? Well, it's, it's a bit of a dirty word. Promotion. That's right. Say it with me. Promotion. Promotion. Yes, you're going to need to put some effort into promoting your podcast. And today we're going to be talking about some different ways that you can promote your podcast, including the following, right, SP? Sure. We're talking about stuff like taking out advertisements on major news publications and on their websites. We're talking about paying for a Sirius XM channel to play your podcast 24 seven. You can just rent one of those puppies out or or. I love this one. It's hiring a skywriting company 
over New York City. So you fly it all the way around the city and you do the sky writing multiple different places. So over 50 million people see your show. That's great. And, 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 and our personal favorite is paying a place to strategically put your advertisements on a famous celebrity when they have a wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl. All of these are great ideas, and we're going to go into all of them this show. No, wait, no, Th those aren't attainable for you. What? What? Okay, fine, fine. We'll actually talk about some other things than these. Instead, <sighs> what we're going to talk about are ways that you can promote your podcast without spending money directly. Yes, today we're going to talk about some different methods to help you promote your podcast that are free. Now, we should caveat that it is going to cost you some of your time, but we're talking about you're not paying out money for something that will advertise. And the reason we want to go through this is because as a hobby podcaster, we recognize that, that usually budgets are tight. And so as we go through these, we're going to go ahead and also share some firsthand experience that SP and I have using these methods. And let's kick it off with Stargate Pioneer's favorite thing. He's on all of these places everywhere. He loves every single platform. It's social media. Social media provides a real opportunity to promote your show if it's done correctly. Now you've instantly posting a message out there that can be shared, responded to, and just generally create conversation. It's all tied back to your show. And we've talked about social media in the past, so we're not going to get into the details of using social media, but we are going to discuss some of the recommendations when trying to use social media to advertise your podcast. Some of the best practice recommendations include make the post feel organic. Even if you know you're simply posting a straight for episode X of my podcast is out sort of post, it's important that you make it not feel like spam. Let me state that again. You don't want it to look and feel like spam. For example, blasting it out repeatedly and make it seem just, oh my gosh, just over, over formulated and kills a lot of opportunity to interact with people and get conversation going. If it's the same post that's retweeted or reposted every time, every, every 15 minutes or three times a day or whatever, that's not going to work. So if you've not received the initial response to your post that you were hoping for and or you want to follow up, a great way to do this is to go back to your original post and then post some interaction related to that episode. Let's say, for example, you run a podcast about a television show. If you make an initial post about the episode release, one way to encourage conversation is to take that post and ask a question about the episode. What was your favorite moment from that episode is a question example. Another one is, what did you think when that character did that? Or can you believe that thing happened at the end? Or even, you know, I really didn't like the episode for whatever reason. You know, instead of saying whatever, you say what the reason is. So those are some of the things you can do. If you use a show account and a personal account, you can go back and forth between the two so it doesn't seem like you're spamming one or the other within terms of service of course right but you you want to kind of limit and focus your social media posting to one account per your show if you can do that i've done this quite successfully over on twitter let's just take that for example so for example with better podcasting we will be live tonight there's a post from the at better pod twitter we will be live tonight at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time at www.geeks.live with the latest Better Pod. Hope to see you in our live chat. Now, I can go ahead and retweet that and say, for example, we know most Americans have NCAA tournament withdrawal for one more day, so we're doing our part to give you something to watch tonight instead of basketball. Check out our live stream tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time, and you might just learn something for your podcast. That's an example of a retweet that gives more information. Another example from the Starling Tribune, it was one of the recent episodes that was posted, the Starling Tribune post was, hashtag Nissa was back, we discuss at CW Arrow, season seven, 16th episode, Star City 2040, directed by James Banford and written by Schwartz Approved and Oscar Baldorama. We also run down the week in DC TV news at 
Arrow Writers at Schwartz approved. Now I went ahead and retweeted that and said, in a season full of great Arrow episodes, Star City 2040 added to the count. Schwartz approved had continued to deliver fun, entertaining, and meaningful stories. In this week's Starling Tribune, we discussed this great episode directed by the action hero himself, James Banford. So as you can see, with the initial post like from Lipson for Starling Tribune, it's a little abbreviated because it also puts a link to the episode in there and a player for the episode. So there's not a lot of space to get a lot of great conversations going. There's a lot of hashtags going on. There's a lot of referencing accounts from the show going on. So it's hard to get a coherent sentence out. Whereas a retweet, either from your personal account or from the actual account that the podcast is, gets to tell a little bit more about the episode. Here's one from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. account. The tweet was hashtag and then they kiss. We discussed the Marvel Punisher series eighth episode Cold Steel brought to us by director Antonio Campos and writer Felicia D. Hashtag people soup. Hashtag sadness sandwich. Hashtag hung like, hung like a moose. Try to say that three <laughs> times straight. And then my response to that was pretty standard short, but it was actually appropriate. It said, Another great show with at Sithwitch, at Awesome Engineering Girl, and at Michelle Ely. So it was just saying it was a fun show. And that was a fun show, as the hashtag should tell you. That those <laughs> hashtags were from us. So those are some examples of being able to leverage hashtags, conversations, and further the conversation with your show and the tweet or the post, wherever you are. The same can be done on Instagram. Or what's that other thing? I can't, I can't, I can't remember. It's blue. It's got one letter in the Google plus uh, Google plus you're thinking of the plus, right? No, no. I'm, I'm th it's got a letter. It's not a plus. It's oh, uh, oh, MySpace. Right, right. MySpace. Yes. No, I, I <sighs> Facebook, th Facebook, the Facebook, the Facebook. Yes. Yeah, the Facebook. the Facebook of the which I'm not on. <laughs> So all kidding aside, the reason we wanted to run through some of those uh, tweets there that SP has previously done with his show was just to give you some ideas on how you can kind of drum up some conversation on there. So, you know, like some of it's about the show, some of it's about the actual recording session. Some of it is just in general to do with what is surrounding the podcast. So it's really just a way to open up some different lines of communication surrounding your podcast. Now, with that said... We're not saying that you can't go and promote your podcast more directly. And one of the best ways that you can do this, and a good example that a lot of people do, is taking excerpts from your show. You know, making a small clip about your po uh, podcast episode to help sample a to a potential listener. There are a variety of services that are available to do this. Now, some of them are going to be built into media hosts but others are more third-party services. For example, there is Wave, which is W-A-A-V-E, and available at www.wave.co. You've got Auphonic, you've got Headliner, and you've got WNYC Open Source Audiogram Generation Code. That's, that's an easy one to remember. Yeah, that's if you want to actually code yourself. This came out a few years ago, the open source audiogram generation code so you could go out and do one yourself. There used to be some others in the space. Clamor was one that I loved for a while, but it's limited now to those options. At least those are the ones that I've seen mentioned recently. I know Headliner, it used to be Spearmin, and I think it's still run by Spearmin, but now it's called Headliner. It's either an app or a sub company from Spearmin. And Ophonic, you really have to, there's a lot of control with Ophonic, but you have to be prepared. You have to actually go in with the clip. You have to go in with the image and it, then it generates whatever you want. Wave is a little bit more like Clamor than Ophonic. So there is some give and take between these and I've used them, but it does take time. So if you want to get that picture with audio out to say Instagram, this is one way to do it. Now, on my shows, what I would do is I wouldn't use an audiogram. I would actually use the video and I would use my movie studio to actually, because we do video shows and we have the talking head. So why would I do an audiogram? 
I would just use the talking head. So anyway, those are the options that are available. Now, if you have other options, listener, that you've used for an audiogram, let us know recently, by the way, because these come and go. Let us know, and we'll talk about it in a future show. So some best practice recommendations that we have is first, keep in mind that this clip is potentially the first impression that you are going to give a potential listener. In all likelihood, you're putting a ton of time and effort into your product to create a good show and put your best foot forward. You're going to be doing editing and recording, and you're just putting all of this time and effort into your show. Don't you want that to be reflected in this clip that you're going to be posting? Yes, what we're saying is that even though you spent countless hours recording, editing, publishing, and you might have felt like you've got that checkered flag long in your rear view mirror. The reality is if you're going to do this clip, you got a little bit more work ahead of you. So make sure when you're selecting a clip that you have it entice a potential listener. It should be captivating. You want to get to the point fairly quick because you don't know how much time you've got from that person. And most importantly, make people want to hear more of your show. It's the goal there is to get people to check out your podcast. And also remember, a little bit of production value into these clips go a long way. Even if it's simple, a little bit of intro music, outro music, or a simple intro or outro to direct people the right way, just polish it up a little bit. It makes the difference and helps make you put that best foot forward to a potential listener. Oh, and finally... When you are putting these clips together, make sure you leave telling the potential listener where they can find your show, because if you manage to get them through to the end, you want to make sure they know how they can keep listening to you and find out more. There's a lot of people that just go and they just take a little simple clip and they have no direction in that clip. So if it gets shared without the original post, you have no idea how to check out the rest of that show. Now, some experience that we've done that I've got here doing this is sort of piggybacking off what SP was saying with the video, because I do video shows as well. But the way that we do this, and we did this quite a bit in 2018, and honestly, not as much in 2019. But what I would do is at the end of each show, I would go and I'd get the host, and we would usually do this offline. And we would do a little bit of a quick intro. Like I'd go, hey, I'm Steven from Better Podcasting. Here's a little bit of what you missed this week. So when somebody does open up the clip, clip, they've got a quick introduction on what it is. And then after that, we would end up having something funny or unique that's going to go ahead and make people want to hear more. It was also to help show that we're not recycling the same material week to week because there was a custom intro every week. Yes, I would recycle the intro for that episode. So if I had four different clips that I'd post out through the week, it would be the same intro. But at least next week, there was something that was different. Now, the short clip that I picked was always something that I thought was either funny or informative. Again, just to hook people in and make them want to hear some more. And then at the end, there would be a little bit of an advertisement on how they can find out more. On the GunnaGeek.com show, we were trying to build the live profile a little bit more, so it ended with a bit of an outro that we had saying, watch the GunnaGeek.com show live on Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at Geeks.Live. Over here, it would be just an on-screen advertisement, because again, it was video-based, that would say where people could find us. Now, here's one of the best experiences that I had, was that I actually had a lot of people comment on these clips on social media, and to me... It seems like it was a really good avenue that I did try out and I got to get back into it in 2019 because honestly, I think that I'm, I'm missing some free promotion. One of the areas of success that we've both had in order to promote our shows involves guesting. The first area we'll talk about is having guests on your own show. And whether the guest is a notable name or not, having a guest on your show can help promote your show. Obviously, with a notable name, you get the opportunity to capitalize on their name to a degree, perhaps the area that they're known for, but don't think of this as the best promotion you'll get. A lot of times, these notable names are making a variety of appearance, and they won't put much effort into advertising your particular show. Sometimes, on the other hand, a Joe Average guest 
can be a great opportunity to help promote your show. Why? Because this person, especially if they're a fan of your show, is probably just really excited to be on the show. Often, they're going to want to share that with the world. And one example that we have is way back, I think this was like five years ago, maybe six years ago, I was guesting on the Gunna Geek Show. What? You weren't the original host on the Gunna Geek Show? I'm shocked, SP. <laughs> no, I was not. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I came in uh, halfway through the show's <laughs> run so far. Yeah, and... Uh... The thing with this is what was interesting for me was I did have SP come on and guest on the gunnageek.com show. And honestly, often he would end up guesting and then tweet or Facebook back in those days about it afterwards. And he would talk all about how he guessed it on the gunnageek.com show after I had him on there. So basically, I got SP to do my bidding. <laughs> yeah, nicely done. Nicely done. Back when I was pining to be on other podcasts. <laughs> Still am. I'll still guess on any show. Just give me a call. Uh, truthfully, this isn't the only experience we've had in this area, though, right, Stephen? No. Back when I did a comic book podcast, I'd often have on there independent comic book creators on the show. They were honestly people with very little name recognition as a whole, but we would interview them. And because of what the site was all about and everything, we would actually end up getting some pretty good content that our listeners would like. And guess what? After we had these people guest, they wanted to share it everywhere. And again, they would. They would go and they would share all sorts of to do all sorts of different places their appearance on our show. And even though they might have had a limited following, we would so often see people say, "Hey, I saw you interview so and so, and I wanted to check out your show." So definitely, having guests on your show is something that can help you grow your show. Of course, you want to make sure your guests appearances do fit in with your show. Now, having a guest on your show isn't the only way, though, to use guesting to promote your show. Perhaps you can manage to guest on another show. Now, this one's a little bit harder because you need to make sure you're not just inviting yourself to the party. And there's also situations where somebody might have to really wonder if you're the right fit for the show. And if somebody has a call for guests and you can definitely absolutely pursue those. I've seen a couple of those and I've looked into them and I've wondered if I was the right fit for the show or not. In some cases, it's been yes. In some cases, it's been no, and I haven't pursued it further. But for whatever the reason is I'm getting on the show, when you have that opportunity, don't waste it. And when we say don't waste it, we don't mean to turn it into a big billboard for your show or your content. I mean, seriously, you come off spamming. And you'll have the opposite effect because nobody's going to want to check out your show. But if you go back to our social media talk that we just discussed, you could make any name dropping of your show feel organic. And ideally, the host will set you up for those opportunities. So just bring them up in normal conversation and make sure you thank the host at the end. We did a whole series on guesting on a show earlier on in the podcast. So make sure you check out those if you're interested to do it, but just realize that guesting on another show is part of being able to promote your show. Now, moving on, the next area that we want to talk about is utilizing your back catalog in another medium to help promote your show. Now, this is a little hard to do without seeming spammy, but it definitely can be effective. However, if you're spending all the time that you have in order to create content every episode, why are you accepting that it's only useful through audio? Especially if you are offering a lot of unique and original content, such as interviews, research, processes, etc., etc. If you are participating in other communities on your subject matter, such as Reddit, community forums, Stephen in the Facebook groups, <laughs> perhaps there's a way that you can use this in a relevant conversation. For example, maybe you do a podcast on paint drying. Recently on the show, you've interviewed one of the leading painters in the world. You know, the type of painter who has a unique technique to help make paint drying happen, especially long, allowing you to savor the experience, the smells, and the texture of wet paint. And let's say that you're also a part of one of the best paint drying subreddits. In a conversation over there, somebody mentions that they're really looking into lengthen 
their paint drying experience. You could link to your interview within the discussion, keeping it relevant to the conversation. That's the big thing. Keep it relevant to the conversation. Don't just spam it out there. And you don't want to force the promotion. But if it is relevant, it can be very helpful. For example, I've been pretty active in the podcasting subreddits. And there, it, when there's a episode of Better Podcasting that's relevant to advice somebody is asking for, I'll go ahead and I'll put the link into the episode. But it's important to note that one, I've built my credibility there where there's less people there that think I'm spamming. And that took a lot of time. And also, there's always a written description with a link for the episode for more information. This way it presents people with the direct information they were seeking, but also invites them to possibly learn a little bit more through the link or the episode if needed. Another example of using this would be in direct conversation with people, usually written because honestly, in person on the phone doesn't always work so well. If you're emailing someone directly about a subject that you've covered on your podcast, you could potentially slide that in in the same way that SP just mentioned a minute ago with like Reddit posts, as long as it's relevant and doesn't come up feeling spammy. Now, this opportunity often comes up if you're involved with another community or a public situation where you are getting people emailing you on subjects related to the podcast that you do. An example that would be I do get people emailing me through the GunnaGeek.com website, which often ties into one of the podcasts on the network or even one that I do. So if I do find something that is relevant to the conversation, I'll try to slide in a link to that so that it, again, encourages people to check that out. But I, I don't want it to be spammy either. You know, another thing we should mention right now while we're talking about using your podcast content to promote your show is that if you're going to do this in person, it is a whole other beast. And if you want to try to promote your podcast in person, it needs to be done very gently, and you should check out episode 156 at betterpodcasting.com slash 156, where we did specifically talk on this subject. One of the next things that we're going to talk about here is one of my favorites, to be honest, and it is cross-promotion. Cross-promotion can happen through a network. You can also form agreements with other podcasts. It doesn't have to be with a network. And this can be as simple as reaching out to somebody that you know and seeing if you want to exchange promos. I actually see this all the time on the subreddits, and I know Steven has seen this all the time on Facebook. When you're doing this, reach for the stars. Maybe there's another show that you know of that could be interested in cross-promotion, and you just don't know if you don't ask. And you might perceive this other show as having a larger audience than you, and maybe they don't, but you just don't know it. But anyway, you hold them in high esteem, and they can go ahead and play your promo. For example, Steven, back in the day when he had a very successful comic book show, he actually went out and reached out to a larger comic book video show. Yes, I did. We were starting off early and we thought we were, we were doing okay and presenting ourselves all right. And so there was another, they, they had a podcast, but they were doing a lot of video content. And so we reached out to them and actually we, we at the time, were willing to put out a little bit of money and we had said to them, do you want to go ahead or can we go ahead and do a bit of advertising to which they ended up actually wanting to do a bit of an exchange cross promotion. Obviously, they were helping us out because they clearly had the numbers that were much higher than ours, but they were willing to do that and do a bit of an exchange on the, our show and they would do one on their show. So it worked out really well. And we were able to build a little bit of a relationship that lasted a while, kept in contact with them for quite some time. So it definitely worked out all because we did open up that conversation with them. Now, cross promotions don't just stop at promoting with other podcasts. No, there are other potentials for you to do cross promotion within your niche. For example, Maybe you know of an up and coming website that does have some written co content and articles in your niche, or maybe there's a YouTube channel again, that's offering some content within your niche, or maybe there's a local event that again is to do with your niche. Cross promotion can come in a variety of different forms. And sometimes it's just a simple cross promotion swap. 
But maybe on the other hand, it's a cross promotion or a cross exchange of services. Like a good example of this would be if there was some form of convention to do with whatever you cover and it was just sort of starting out and you could end up reaching out to them and basically make an exchange where there was some form of podcast covering for their convention. Maybe it's some form of on-site thing or maybe it's something leading up to it for exchange for some advertising at that event. It's just an idea of a one way that you could possibly make this happen. Now, this probably won't work for larger events, but for smaller startups, this can actually work well. I've mentioned this in the past on some other shows, mostly the Gonna Geek show. Back in I was a young Stephen John Drew, I used to help organize LAN parties. If you don't know what a LAN party is, it's a gaming party where a bunch of people got together and played games because this was back in the day before internet was fast. So everybody would bring their physical computers there and we'd all set up. Well, we would need people to help sponsor those LAN parties. And we used to regularly be able to lock down those sponsorships with different computer stores in exchange for something that they wanted. And generally it was they wanted to go ahead and set up on site, basically like a kiosk. And this ended up being mutually beneficial because we got what we needed, but they also got to sell stuff on site. There were all really good success for them because people would forget to bring things like a good mouse or a network cable. Yes, before Wi-Fi or people would all of a sudden just be enticed to upgrade their computer or their computer. You know, this happened before a couple of times would just pack it in at the event and they wanted to go get a new computer. So it was a deal we were able to make that was mutually beneficial. Now, this isn't a podcast example, but it's an example on how sometimes cross promotions can help and work together. Now, if you are going to try to do a cross promotion with somebody or a cross exchange with somebody, we do recommend a few things. If you're going to do this route, we recommend to be realistic with your targets and make sure it's mutually beneficial. Don't put yourself at risk and make sure your partnership is in line with your brand or your vision or your ethics. Don't put too much at stake. Usually free cross promotions aren't going to end up with a legally binding agreement. So you don't want to get too badly burned if something goes ahead and happens. You can also build your credibility in whatever niche that you're in as a promotion opportunity. This is an area that we could expand on for an entire episode, but it is one we need to mention here at least. Now we alluded to it earlier with my Reddit example we went to call it out specifically, but if you're able to build your credibility in the niche, it can help bring natural promotion to yourself. Now this can be done through a variety of ways, such as calling into voicemail lines. Man, I remember hearing that quite a bit about four or five, six years ago, people would actually call into other voicemail lines and of, of podcasts that were either in their niche or in adjoining niches or, or whatever. You don't hear that too much anymore because you don't really see too many voicemail lines anymore. Responding to questions, that's a good thing to do. Providing advice to people, interacting with others on a regular basis that are within the niche and participating in communities. This is all participating or giving advice or talking back and forth. Like if you're in a Marvel community, Talk about who your favorite Marvel characters are. Get involved in those discussions. Don't say, hey, we talked about it on this episode of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. No, I wouldn't do that. Not in those communities. Now, why is this different than what we spoke about earlier? We wanted to mention that this is an indirect promotion, not a direct promotion. The reason this can work, because if you build a name for yourself, people might want to seek more of you. Remember how we've said before that people may follow you to other projects because they like you? Well, the same applies sometimes if you build your name. Additionally, others who do get to check out your show may start to refer to your show if they speak about you. For example, we have a voicemail from Joe of Joe's Paint Drying Podcast. So that is an indirect promotion. And we've both experienced this in various communities. As you build your credibility in those communities, sometimes people will do the advertising for you. Now, 
before we close up, we do have a bit of a miscellaneous section that we would love to go in depth with all of these ideas, but we just don't have time for that. And so we want to go ahead and give a couple other things to think about before we do move on to the download. One thing that we would be remiss if we didn't mention was joining a podcast network or a directory of some form. Yes, this has a whole bunch of other things to consider, but it can work for people. We've talked about podcast networks in the past, and we need to mention right now that sometimes if it's a, it's a good network, it could potentially help you with cross promotion. You could also do email blasts to subscribers of highlights. Now, this is usually people who are already aware of you, but you're wanting to sort of get them to check out a specific episode or re-engage with them. So blasting them a highlight. Again, within rules, we mentioned terms of service earlier, there are different anti-spam laws now, so make sure you follow that. If you have multiple shows running ads for your other show or cross-promoting it on the show, if you do more than one show, you should definitely find a way that you can constantly mention something that could potentially get somebody to check out those other shows. Or you could even, if you really wanted to, create a better podcasting after show that's very flattering towards us so that we will highlight it here on Better Podcasting. I think that's the, the best tip that we've offered. Um, maybe not. Okay, fair enough. In conclusion, no matter what method you're using to promote your show, there are some similarities. Don't be afraid to ask. Make sure you're not coming off spammy. Don't expect that it's going to be easy, and you should put some quality time into it. Make sure you work towards putting your best foot forward and always remember that anyone you're reaching out to with any of these methods is potentially checking you out for the first time. And this is the first impression you are going to make for them. Always keep that in mind with any way that you try to promote your show. If you've got some ways that you've been able to promote your show for free, Make sure to let us know by sending us an email to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And by the way, when you do reach out to us, make sure to mention the name of your podcast because we'll say it on here and promote your show for free. Welcome to this week's Better Podcasting Download. So this week, it's been full of podcasting information. We've actually got a lot to talk about. And one of the things that came out, I think got maybe more play than it probably should have. But in any event, we're going to talk about it here because we're going to talk about the relevancy to hobby podcasters. And that's what Google has been doing to the BBC. Yeah. So here's what happened this past week is all of a sudden it came out in the world of podcasting that apparently BBC has blocked Google and Google Podcasts from their podcast, the BBC podcast. Yes, the BBC put out a blog post that said the following. Last year, Google launched its own podcast app for Android users. They've also said they will launch a browser version for computer suit. Google has since begun to direct people who search for a BBC podcast into its own podcast service rather than BBC Sounds or third-party services, which reduces people's choice, an approach the BBC is not comfortable with and has consistently expressed strong concerns about. We asked them to exclude the BBC from this specific feature, but they have refused. As a public service, we want our content and services to be available to as many people as possible, and we make these available for free on a range of third-party apps, but as the BBC, funded by, uh, by the license fee payers in the UK, we have to ensure it is done in a way that is good for all audiences according to our distribution policy, which has been agreed on with Ofcom, whatever that is. Never heard of it. Never heard of it either. Continues on. The next part of the paragraph says, In the UK, we have a creative and flourishing radio and podcast industry, and the BBC plays a significant part in this, which we're really proud of. So we want to make sure podcasts made in and championing the UK are prominent on global platforms. Continues on. Another part of the pair of the post said, Unfortunately, given the way 
the Google Podcast service operates. We can't do any of the above. We don't like removing our content from services and certainly don't do it lightly. But unfortunately, until Google changes the way they look at this, for the good of listeners, our podcast will not be available on some of their services. We are in discussion with Google to try and resolve this situation and will continue to work with them to try to come to a solution that is in the best interest of all listeners. So that's from the blog post by the BBC. Now, the long story short, everybody talked about this like it was a really big deal. And ultimately what it came down to was the BBC utilized a feature called robots. Dot txt. <gasps> Stephen, what is robots.txt? What it is is it's it's basically AI. So there's there's this artificial intelligence that is just cutting edge technology that is is basically the future of all civilization. Oh wait, no, sorry, robots.txt is a feature that has been available on web spaces for like ever. In the early days of websites and Google's searches and other uh, search engines and whatnot, there was this agreed standard that basically came out called robots.txt. If you have a website, you throw a certain piece of code into a file that literally is on your website called robots.txt, txt being a text file, and all it does is tell the search engine whether or not you would like to be indexed or not. And that's what it comes down to. You can filter that down to certain pages or different sections of your site, but it's something that's been around for a very, very long time, and Google respects this. Again, it's basically an ask. It's not definitely blocking bots and whatnot, but if bots do end up actually respecting this, they will follow that. And of course, Google, as a mainstream search engine, does respect that. And that's all they did was with their podcast, they utilized this robots.txt thing, which again is not anything new. And honestly, we've used it here for our podcast for some podcast listing that Google's, Google has found where we've been mirrored elsewhere and we've had control of that. And we've implemented a robots.txt file to get people off of that. So this is not anything new from a website perspective, but because it was the BBC blocking Google, putting a blog post out saying they don't like how Google's operating. We don't like how Google is operating their own service and how they are choosing what they want to do on their own search engine. It blew up. This is all about the data. BBC has come out and said that they want the user data, just like they would get user data from Apple podcasts like you and I can through the Apple podcast or the podcast connect portal. They have said that they want that same user data from Google, and Google's not made it available to anybody, really. So this is just BBC making a power play. Note that the BBC did not pull their shows from Apple Podcasts. First of all, they probably get the data from Apple Podcasts. Second of all, Apple Podcasts is roughly 65% of all downloads, so of course they're not going to go ahead and do that. And they're probably not going to go ahead and do this with Spotify either. They'll try to come to another arrangement with it. This is just a power play. Because Google Podcasts aren't all that prevalent in the statistics just overall yet. So I don't think this is the end of podcasting. Also, as I pointed out in several responses, this is not the end of podcasting, free and open podcasting as we know it. RSS feeds, as they're out there, continue to work. If you want your podcast out to different places, that is what an RSS feed is. And then these podcatchers catch the RSS feed, they put it in their directory, and people listen to your podcast that way. That's how it works. And as long as there's an RSS feed and podcast directories out there that will accept the RSS feed, you're good to go. The problem comes when those start to be taken away. And there's no talk about that right now. But I've been worried about this for a couple of years. And we've actually mentioned it on a past Better Podback or download, podcasting download. And I worry about that day where podcast directories charge to actually accept your RSS feed. They don't, nobody does it now, but these walled communities and people trying to make money off of podcasting right now, eventually it might work right now. Free and open is where you want to be because that is how the majority of people listen. 
Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Obviously, we've said it before, Google Podcasts, we don't think they've done a great job of making it easy to uh, essentially control what they index and whatnot. But um, that is something that I'm guessing is intentional because they operate that way with the rest of their product, right? Like Google itself basically does all of the work and that's what they are doing with their podcast. So it's really not surprising. You had one other thing you wanted to mention in the download, right, SP? I, did, I actually had a couple of other things. First one is that rebelbasedmedia.io, they had an article out there which was titled The Gap Between India and Big Podcasting Cause for Concern. Again, this is something that I've been talking about for a couple of years now, something that we're concerned with on Better Podcasting. I do share a lot of the same concerns, but again, as long as the RSS 2.0 feeds are still valid, and they're getting kind of long in the tooth because they're 15 years old right now, so I don't know when technology is going to want to pass them by. But they're still relevant. They're still valid today. You still have podcatchers out there today. So I don't think there's any huge cause. It's going to be a cause when the audience starts to go elsewhere than the podcatchers. Like the audience for TV, all of a sudden, where are they going? They're going to streaming services like Hulu, like Amazon Prime, like Netflix, instead of watching over the air TV or cable based TV. When that shift happens for podcasting, that would be more of a concern than anything going on with a Spotify acquisition of Anchor. I mean, that's just not relevant for free and open podcasting. So another thing, but at least people are talking about it. At least people are concerned, which is better than people not being concerned. So I'll take that for granted. And I think in that article basically says the same thing. The other thing that I want to mention, we've talked about the IAB podcast measurement standards 2.0 that have been out there for quite some time. There is a competing standard that's out there. It's called RAD, and mostly it's NPR that wants to, that has created RAD and wants to use RAD because they want the user data again. Well, the problem is nobody's really supporting it. The other thing that happened this past week is stream guys went ahead and they are supporting RAD. So RAD's got a couple of main players in it, stream guys, which I don't know if there's necessarily a main player, but we'll just call them that. Stream guys, NPR, they're both using RAD. It's another statistical feedback process standard, if you will. I just don't think this is going to catch on because the rest of the industry is not. The rest of the industry is just going to use their IAB podcast measurement guidelines 2.0. And that's the standard that's going to be used. Not everybody's on that yet. I mean, you still have SoundCloud that's not on there. Anchor is not on there. They're going to have to fix that in order to be relevant going forward because ad buyers the way that they make money through the the podcast media host that's going to use that. So I don't think that's a big cause for concern at the moment. I know if you hear about rad, it's more of a business thing. It is not for independent podcasters and it's definitely not for hobby podcasters. All right, let's round up some better pod back this week, and we'll start off by hitting on a few lengthy conversations that we had over the last week in our Discord server. First off, we had a fun back and forth with a bunch of different people talking about their editing preferences, and it went down Audacity, Audition, some other DAWs. There was a whole bunch of back and forth, what people liked, why they liked it, and it was just a ton of fun. On the heels of that editing discussion, we had C. Houston 3 say, It takes forever to edit. Right now, I'm cranking out breathing noises to non-annoying levels. So the ability to go faster is sanity saving. Has anyone tried Twisted Wave as a substitute for audacity? And yeah, lots of really great things that came out of that conversation. There was also some great talk about new European Union regulations. And those could be interesting. We'll see what happens. Apparently, it's EU. It's not country specific. So we'll just see where they. I, I don't want to get more specific, but it was a great conversation. So if you want to know, be more in the know about what's going on there, check out the Discord server. And then also, uh, Stephen had a favorite chat run, and it had all to do with his favorite new toy, the Roadcaster Pro. Yeah. So started off with none other than Bang's Naughty Bits in our Discord server saying, someone's asking if you need a Cloudhead slash Fetlifter on a Rodecaster Pro with this SM7B. 
seems close, but on the no side by the numbers. And so we went back and forth a little bit on that. And in that conversation, I ended up expressing that I liked my DBX 286S preamp better than what was being offered in my experience going directly into the Rodecaster Pro. To which conversation came out of that, that apparently I am not the only one that has shared this opinion and had some troubles with the preamp on the Roadcaster Pro. We had the legendary Bandrew Says come in and say that he had to run his recordings lower than he expected. He says, quote, I couldn't keep the signal in the green. If I remember correctly, I think it sounded kind of clippy there. End quote. And another message he said, I sent it to multiple people when I was testing it out to confirm I wasn't losing my mind, and they told me it was clipping, end quote. So definitely, uh, him and I both have seen very similar things, and this is the sort of stuff you're missing out with if you're not in our Discord server, because him and I both had the same experience. We both thought we were going absolutely insane, apparently, when we were trying this out. So I uh, haven't tried it with the new firmware. We'll see. Um, I'll have to do some more tests. According to Twitter, Twitter Road has said there's more firmware big changes coming. So we'll see. Hopefully, if there is problems, they'll fix that. At this time, Bandrew and I have very similar experience. We also had one final note that we want to mention here. Uh, Yak O Dr. G, who is Jeremy from the Transmissions podcast, he said, I'm en route to C2E2, which is a major convention that's in Chicago every year, March, April timeframe. And it's the first major convention I've had press credentials for. Does anyone that has done this have any tips? I've contacted a few groups ahead of time and have some interviews scheduled, but I'm unsure about protocol for just going up to guests and asking if they have a few minutes to talk to me. Apparently he did great because he shared with us some videos. He was sounding great. He ended up using, I believe his ATR 2100 connected directly into his phone as a mobile recorder. Not what I would recommend if you had the cash to get like a Sennheiser MD46, but it worked great. We've done it before on the Gunna Geek Network with a AT2005. That worked just fine. So any sort of handheld dynamic microphone, as long as you're holding that microphone firm to prevent handling noise back and forth is going to be better than a lap mic or a condenser mic. And Jeremy did just great. I can't wait to hear and see more of his content. That was from C2E2 because I couldn't go this year. I've gone in the past. We've actually done a Gunna Geek panel, podcasting panel at there at C2E2 in the past. So I was lamenting the fact that I wasn't able to go. We also had over in the Discord, Bangs Naughty Bits, make another comment. He says, I just got my third MY420 shock mount. This one arrived completely disassembled, and there is a part I have no clue what it is exactly. So Apparently, he had some fun with an My 3 420. You also have to wonder about stuff that you get from different shippers because it might be like a return that's thrown back into a box and the return might have come in with extra parts and stuff like that. So you got to wonder about that sometimes. And you might want to think if that happens to you to send it back for another one, say there's something defective about this, or if you just want to take it and Try to be creative with that mm -hmm. extra part. Go ahead and do just that. Also, we had Chuston in the Discord say, I get the impression that many big podcasts use gear and software that is completely inaccessible to normal human beings. While that's true and not true, very astute Chuston, a big podcast studio like Westwood One or maybe Gimlet, they do have some professional audio gear available to them that you don't but that's why we do better podcasting because you can get the same quality sound for much 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 less money and have a great listenable podcast that really sound wise you can't really tell the difference in earbuds moving on to twitter we had a uh, interesting response to a tweet that i put out there uh on saturday when i was going and about to edit the show I posted, I, I was feeling fun. So I posted a picture of my Better Podcasting mug, and I said, sitting down to edit at Better Pod, time to make this sound better by muting my track. <laughs> to which Josh Liston responded saying, yes, do so liberally and save us from that Canadian flub fest. Josh, you are right in many ways. 
<laughs> so if you got something you want to say with us, please get in touch with us through any of the ways you can head on over to betterpodcasting.com. Now, before we close, we've been talking over the last few episodes how we're starting a new segment called the pod warming segment. And we're going to be getting to that next week again. We'll get back to that. But we had something really special and unique that we wanted to go ahead and acknowledge here on this show. So we're shelving that for this week. And SP, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. This could be considered a heartwarming moment, but it, it's it's really based on something that's kind of sad. So we just didn't want to make it a heartwarming moment. But one of the podcasts that has previously applied to the Gunna Geek Network, they went on to another network called Ear Glue Media. And the podcast is called Smoking and Drinking in Space. It, it was a great sci-fi podcast. It's not suitable for work. In other words, they cuss quite a bit on there. So if you don't like that sort of thing, or you're listening to podcasts around kids, don't listen to this podcast. Uh, there's not a lot of that in this episode, though, that I'm talking about. It is their one year anniversary episode. It's episode 52 of Smoking and Drinking in Space. Unfortunately, between the time that Smoking and Drinking in Space applied to the Guinea Geek Network and then moved on to the Ear Glue Media Network, one of the hosts, Red, passed away due to a rare blood infection. So Jason, who's the producer of the show, has decided to go on with the show. But as a tribute to Red, he asked a lot of the people that have listened to the show to come in and give their thoughts of Red as a podcaster. And this was really neat that I was asked to come on for it as well. Now, Red was one of the guys that would just say the craziest things, and he would piece together bits and pieces of knowledge and just be funny about it and everything. And I would have loved to have met Red in person. I really would have. And unfortunately, I, I don't have that chance. So I had the chance to go on the show and talk about Red. Now, just listen to the episode. It just came out as we were recording just about 12 hours ago or so. And I was able to listen to the entire thing. It was great hearing heartwarming moment after heartwarming moment from other podcasters that had listened to the show and that Jason had asked to come on to talk about Red. It was a, a moving experience. I know it's not the first podcast host that has passed away while the podcast was running. Uh, sadly, it's becoming a little bit more commonplace than it used to be. I've run into it several times in the past year. And it's sad every single time it happens, especially if it's a podcaster that you really want to hear more from. And this was our chance to, to be there and, and talk about it. And it was also Jason's chance to have a, a little therapy, and he, which he really needed. He got to the end of the episode and he admitted it. He, he was uh, crying up, tearing up quite a bit. And he said it was the hardest episode he's ever had to edit, but also the funnest episode he's ever had to edit because he got to remember his good friend, Red, who he's known... Uh, more than half his life, basically, and uh, they're older guys like me, and so this was not um, high school friendship or something like that. This was a lifetime friendship. So if you want to hear that, you want to hear the heartwarming comments that are made by all the people that came together for that show, go to Smoking and Drinking in Space podcast. It's part of the Ear Glue Media Network, and just listen to how well Jason did that. I my hat is off to Jason for having the idea, coming up with the idea, asking everybody to be on actually executing it, because I don't know if I could have in his place. And I know it was a terrible, terrible thing to go through. But if you've had that experience as well, um, I, I know it's terrible. And I just think he did a great job of it. So once again, that's Smoking and Drinking in Space. Jason's the main host, and it's at the Ear Glue Media Network. So on that, we're going to go ahead and close down the episode. So for episode 174 of Better Podcasting, I'm Stephen John Drew saying I encourage you to check out that episode. I'm SP saying thanks for listening this week and we look forward to seeing you next week. And please go check out that episode. Thank you for listening to another episode of Better Podcasting. We want to hear from you. You can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. If you like the show, please consider giving us a five-star review in iTunes. We encourage you to check out all of the other geeky podcasts available at gunnageeknetwork.com. This has been a Gunna Geek production. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week.